Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In chapter one of her work, The Virtue of Selfishness, which is the essay, The Objectivist Ethics, Ayn Rand is going to set out a sort of, to those who know this sort of thing, a rather familiar hierarchy of being that places humans at the top and mere being, or as she calls it, matter at the bottom and has animals located below human beings and plants located be, uh, below them in between matter and uh, bare being and, and animals. All of these are material things, but some of them are living and some of them are conscious. Now, the reason why she's elaborating this, and we're representing it sort of schematically in a way that she doesn't admittedly do within this essay, is because we can see how you move from one stage to the next and what the implications of that are from her philosophical and ethical perspective, which is focused here primarily on, on two things. One is the notion of survival as that kind of thing. And the other is the generation of values. So let's start out with the absolute bottom. She says that, you know, there is uh, such a thing as mere matter. And she even talks about the possibility of having an indestructible robot who would be a merely material thing, an immortal, indestructible robot, an entity which moves and acts, but which cannot be affected by anything, which cannot be changed, which cannot be damaged, injured, or destroyed. And she says that this kind of being really couldn't have any values because it has nothing to gain or lose. Nothing could be for or against it. It would have no interests and no goals. It's only living things that can do that. Matter, as she says, is indestructible. It changes its forms. It cannot cease to exist. And, you know, the book, for example, or a phone or the chalkboard, they don't care whether they survive or not. They just are what they are. It's only living things that could be said, and when we're talking about plants in a very metaphorical way, even lower animals, to care about whether they continue to exist. But they are self-sustaining entities. They engage in self-sustaining action to allow themselves to maintain their, their being, whatever it happens to be. So she says that um, an organism's life, now we're talking about plants, animals, humans, of course, bacteria and fungi as well. We can talk about other kingdoms of life. Uh, an organism's life depends on two factors, the material or fuel which it needs from the outside, from its physical background, and the action of its own body, the action of using that fuel properly. And she says what standard determines what is proper in this context. The standard is the organism's life or what is required for the organism's survival. So, you know, um, different kinds of plants and animals and single-celled organisms and, you know, other things, whatever other kinds of life we want to imagine, they attempt to maintain themselves in existence by carrying out their typical activities that are largely, we would say nowadays, uh, the product of their, their DNA, right? So when it comes to plants, she says that plants are really just engaging in, in sort of what she calls automatic physical functions. Um, they're not doing anything consciously or deliberately. 
she calls these, for that reason, simpler organisms. They are not actually conscious. They don't feel, for example, pleasure and pain. They don't have intentionality of moving towards or away from things. They're just doing essentially what their programming has directed them to do. So, you know, we might say similar things about bacteria. We might say similar things about other things, you know, molds and things like that as well. Although with bacteria, in some respect, they're a little bit more like animals. Um, the interesting thing about where a virus fits in there as well, a virus really is, uh, we're not even sure whether they're, they're qualified as life or not. They, they definitely do reproduce. So we're going to leave plants aside. We're mostly interested in her discussion of conscious being, which is animals and human beings. So she goes on and she says, um, a plant has no choice of action, right? It just does what it does. But higher organisms like animals and human beings cannot just do automatic physical functions. Their needs are more complex the range of their actions is wider. Even if we think about really low level uh, animals, think about, for example, a tick, which essentially is a tick producing factory. I mean, they do mate and they suck blood and they suck blood uh, in order to produce more ticks. And they really, as far as I understand, have only two modes of sense, um, vibration and heat. Um, they're barely conscious, we might say, you know, um, similarly with many other arthropods, we might say, well, there's not a lot going on there or mollusks, um, you know, does an oyster really engage in much consciousness? Not really, but it does engage in some, it does respond to its environment. And insofar as they are mobile at all, they're, they're making what we can call choices by a kind of analogy. So she says that the range of actions required for the survival of higher organisms is wider. It's proportionate to the range, and here comes a key idea, of their consciousness. So here is where she talks about sensations, perceptions, and concepts. Sensations are the lowest form of consciousness. All of these are involved in consciousness, right? Not all uh, organisms go beyond mere sensations, but then there's perceptions and then there's concepts. So let's see what she has to say about these. She says the lower of the conscious species possess only the faculty of sensation, which is sufficient to direct their action and provide for their needs. A sensation is produced by an automatic reaction of a sense organ to a stimulus from the outside world. It lasts for the duration of the immediate moment as long as the stimulus lasts and no longer. She calls them an automatic response. And here's an interesting turn of phrase, an automatic form of knowledge. Now, if this is knowledge, it's knowledge in a very attenuated sense. So she says that a consciousness of this sort can neither seek nor evade them. And she goes on and she says, an organism that possesses only the faculty of sensation is guided by the pleasure pain mechanism of its body. By, and here she says, an automatic knowledge and an automatic code of values. And again, we might think about many of the arthropods, you know, uh, for example, again, ticks. Um, although, you know, we might be careful in thinking about some spiders. Maybe some spiders actually have perceptions in the way that, that Rand is going to talk about it in just a moment. Um, but, you know, an oyster as well. It sucks in, you know, whatever it happens to eat. I'm not really that, that you know, uh, well-read on oyster biology. <laughs> and then it, it enjoys it, I guess, when it finds something that it doesn't like. Uh, you know, a little bit of sand. It starts making the pearl around it so as to not have to feel the thing that's disturbing it, right? Um, and all of these are essentially automatic processes. They're not really that fundamentally different than those of plants, other than that they have a, a wider scope and wider range. But then we get to, she says, perceptions. She says, higher organisms 
possess a much more potent form of consciousness. They possess a faculty of retaining sensations. So we're talking about memory here, right? Which is the faculty of perception. A perception is a group of sensations automatically retained and integrated by the brain of a living organism that gives it the ability to be aware not of a single stimuli and here here we have an important transition but of entities of things it can recognize that sort of thing as that sort of thing and again this is probably highly dependent on the kind of organism that we're talking about. So, you know, when a spider sees you moving your hand towards it with its, its multiple eyes um, and multiple kinds of eyes, it's not like the spider understands, well, that's a human being. It just understands it as this is a big thing coming at me and it's kind of a threat. I'd better watch out. Or I suppose that, you know, if, if I can't do anything else, I'd better bite it and hope for the best, right? Um, but, you know, think about higher animals such as those that we make into pets. They may have an incredibly complex array of what here uh, Rand is calling perceptions, or sometimes she'll also use the word percepts. So when my cat wakes up in the morning, I'll just use her as an example. She's typically got, you know, my hands nestled around her and she uses me as part of her bed and, you know, lays her little head on my hands. And so there's probably a percept of comfort. And this is my, you know, my person because she's very attached to me. And then we get up and I get out of bed and she stretches herself and, you know, goes and gets some water. Perceiving water is something that, that is to be drunk and distinguishing between, say, water that doesn't taste good and water that does taste good. That's, that's all a matter of percepts, right? That's not mere sensations at this point. And if the water bowl is empty, she'll like look up at me and kind of like, you know, hint at me that I should fill it up. There's, there's a fairly complex process going on there. Then we go downstairs and, you know, we'll get to the head of the stairs and sometimes she wants me to pick her up so she doesn't have to climb down herself. She's 17 years old, so it's perfectly understandable. And then, you know, it's time to feed her and she'll like, you know, hop up. Uh, where the food dish is and like look over at me like, hey, dummy, gonna feed me now? <laughs> and as soon as she like sees me going for the can of her special kidney food, because she's an old cat, um, she's already like attuned. All right, now we're gonna get something to eat. And same thing if, if, if it's Catterday and we give her her fancy feast little portion, which she likes even better. These are all percepts. And they're part of a complex dynamic system, um, but it is, it is still rather limited, right? What, what animals are capable of. Um, so she says here, an animal's actions that has percepts are not single discrete responses to single separate stimuli, but they're directed by an integrated awareness of the perceptual reality confronting it. It's able to grasp the perceptual concretes immediately present and form automatic perceptual associations, but it can't go any further. So there's limitations here. She says uh, it's able to learn certain skills to deal with specific situations, such as hunting or hiding, which the parents of the higher animals teach their young. But an animal has no choice in the knowledge and the skills it acquires. It can only repeat them generation after generation. And they have no choice, this is another really key issue, in the standard of value directing its actions. Its senses provide it, as she says, with an automatic code of values, an automatic knowledge of what is good for it or evil, what benefits or endangers its life. An animal has no power to extend its knowledge or to evade it. So we might say, you know, this... This uh, might need to be made more flexible. What about, you know, really higher animals going beyond cats to dolphins or chimpanzees or things like that? But we won't worry about that right here. Because what Rand wants to drive home to us is the fact that in moving from the merely animal to the human, there is a important transition that takes place. Humans are animals but we're a weird kind of animal, a special kind of animal. 
And she associates this in part with having what she calls concepts. So she, she attributes this in part, and she's not unusual in this, by the way. Um, you know, you can find this in the writings of, of thinkers that she detests, like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, right? Who talks about this as well. There's, there's a certain flexibility to human being that, that derives from the fact that we have fewer instincts and we're not as controlled by our instincts as the other animals are. As a matter of fact, the way she puts it is, man has no automatic code of survival. He has no automatic course of action, no automatic set of values. His senses do not tell him automatically what is good for him or evil, what will benefit his life or endanger it, what goals he should pursue and what means will achieve them, what values his life depends on. His own consciousness has to discover the answers to all of his of these questions, but his consciousness will not function automatically. So we are placed in a rather unusual position as a species where, although, you know, when it comes to like, do we like the taste of blueberries, you know, that sort of thing, that's a matter of sensations and then perceptions. Um, when it comes to all the other things that, that really matter, like, well, I don't know, should I eat blueberries now or, or not? You know, it's, it's a uh, time for me to go to the, uh, lecture hall and I've got this pail of blueberries. Should I bring them along as a snack or shouldn't I? Uh, you know, even a chimpanzee doesn't worry about that sort of thing. We do. Now that's a kind of silly example, but you know, we could multiply many, many examples. Think about our desire for, um, sexual gratification and pleasure, you know, most animals, they handle that pretty well. Uh, they're often frustrated, but, you know, it's it's pretty clear what they need to do at what time. For us, this is just a, a mess that we get totally confused about and get all sorts of contradictory messages. And many of us never quite arrive at a satisfactory way of existing when it comes just to that matter. So... This is quite important, the, the fact that we, we are not as governed by instinct, right? That means that we have choices. That means that we are, in a certain respect, free in ways that other animals are not. Now, Rand frames this also in terms of what she calls conceptual values derived from conceptual knowledge. She says, a concept is a mental integration of two or more perceptual concretes, which are isolated by a process of abstraction and united by means of a specific definition. So, you know, book. This is a, what, what we're calling here a perception. You recognize this as a book, but it's also a concept. Bookness or being a book or something like that. And the word book in language refers to that concept. Our use of concepts, as she says, is not something that's hardwired into us like instincts are. And um, she says that we can, you know, uh, take concepts and, and create wider and still wider concepts. We can identify and integrate an unlimited amount of knowledge and knowledge extending beyond the immediate perceptions of any uh, given immediate moment. So... She says, man's sense organs function automatically. Man's brain integrates his sense data into percepts automatically. But the process of integrating percepts into concepts, this process is not automatic. And so this is, this is quite important because that means that we have a certain responsibility here. And she's going to talk about, really, there's three things that, there, there's many things that are determinative of human beings, but there's three things that she's talking about here that are particularly central to the way in which human beings are. One of them we've already talked about, language, the fact that we can refer to things and we can do more with our modes of communication because other animals communicate too, but we can do more with our modes of communication than they can. The other thing she talks about is reason. And she says, reason is the faculty that identifies and integrates the material provided by man's senses. It's a faculty that we have to exercise by choice. Thinking is not an automatic function. 
focusing one's consciousness is volitional. And so we have another idea here, another actual concept of volition, choice, deliberately doing something. Because, you know, thinking is, is a kind of doing. It's not like thinking and doing are radically separate from each other. So volition, the volitional status of our consciousness is really central to Rand's point of view. She says that um, when a person unfocuses their mind, they may said to be conscious in a subhuman sense of the word because they experience sensations and perceptions. But in the sense of the word applicable to man, in the sense of a consciousness aware of reality and able to deal with it, a consciousness able to direct the actions and provide for the survival of a human being, an unfocused mind is not conscious. Qua human being. It is conscious qua animal. But it's not, it's not fully conscious. So she says, consciousness for those living organisms which possess it is the basic means of survival. For the human being, the basic means of survival is reason. Human beings cannot survive as animals do by the guidance of mere percepts. A sensation of hunger will tell us that we need food, but it will not tell us how to obtain our food, and it will not tell us what food is good for us or poisonous. We, as she goes on, a person cannot provide for their simplest physical needs without a process of thought. So this is something that is really distinctive to us as human beings. This faculty, this capacity of reason. And notice she's not saying that reason is something like an on-off switch that flips as soon as you go from the animal to the human or at a certain age, like turning 12. Boom, now I'm a rational being. It's a continual process that we have to exercise. And I think on this point, Rand is actually... Um, saying things that are quite similar to so many other theorists, some of whom she agrees with, like Aristotle, who she thinks is the best ever, uh, some of whom she, she denigrates. Um, but they're all, they all tend to, to view things in this way, that rationality is not something that we can simply take for granted. So, um, distinctively human consciousness for Ayn Rand is going to be rational consciousness, and that requires that we volitionally exercise it. 